chapter 20, The Inheritance of the Saints. A gift from the Lord. Christ, only Christ, and His righteousness will obtain for us a passport into heaven. Letter number 6B, 1890. The proud heart strives to earn salvation, but both our title to heaven and our fitness for it are found in the righteousness of Christ. Desire of Ages, page 300, 1898. That we might become members of the heavenly family, he became a member of the earthly family. Desire of Ages, page 638, 1898. Better than a title to the noblest palace on earth is a title to the mansions our Lord has gone to prepare. And better than all the words of earthly praise will be the Savior's words to His faithful servants, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Christ Object Lessons, page 374, 1900. Why we should think about the future world. Jesus has brought heaven to view and presents its glory to our eyes in order that eternity may not be dropped out of our reckoning. Signs of the Times, April 4, 1895. With eternal realities in view, we will habitually cultivate thoughts of the presence of God. This will be a shield against the incoming of the enemy. It will give strength and assurance and lift the soul above fear. Breathing in the atmosphere of heaven, we will not be breathing the malaria of the world. Jesus comes to present the advantages and beautiful imagery of the heavenly that the attractions of heaven shall become familiar to the thoughts and memory's hall be hung with pictures of celestial and eternal loveliness. The great teacher gives man a view of the future world. He brings it with its attractive possessions within the range of his vision. If he can fasten the mind upon the future life and its blessedness in comparison with the temporal concerns of this world, the striking contrast is deeply impressed upon the mind, absorbing the heart and soul and the whole being. Our High Calling, pages 285 and 286, 1890. The Christian's Motives Motives stronger and agencies more powerful could never be brought into operation. The exceeding rewards for right doing, the enjoyment of heaven, the society of the angels, the communion and love of God and His Son, the elevation and extension of all our powers throughout eternal ages. Are these not mighty incentives and encouragements to urge us to give the heart's loving service to our Creator and Redeemer? Steps to Christ, pages 21 and 22, 1892. If we can meet Jesus in peace and be saved, forever saved, we shall be the happiest of beings. Oh, to be at home at last, where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest. Letter number 113, 1886. I love to see everything that is beautiful in nature in this world. I think I would be perfectly satisfied with this earth surrounded with the good things of God, if it were not blighted with the curse of sin. But we shall have new heavens and a new earth. John saw this in holy vision and said, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. O oh, blessed hope, glorious prospect. Letter number 62, 1886. 
a real and tangible place. What a source of joy to the disciples to know that they had such a friend in heaven to plead in their behalf. Through the visible ascension of Christ, all their views and contemplation of heaven are changed. Their minds had formerly dwelt upon it as a region of unlimited space, tenanted by spirits without substance. Now heaven has connected with the thought of Jesus, whom they had loved and reverenced above all others, with whom they had conversed and journeyed, whom they had handled, even in his resurrected body. Heaven could no longer appear to them as an indefinite, incomprehensible space filled with intangible spirits. They now look upon it as their future home, where mansions were being prepared for them by their loving Redeemer. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, page 262, 1878. A fear of making the future inheritance seem too material has led many to spiritualize away the very truths which lead us to look upon it as our home. Christ assured his disciples that he went to prepare mansions for them in the Father's house. Great Controversy, pages 674 and 675, 1911. In the earth made new, the redeemed will engage in the occupations and pleasures that brought happiness to Adam and Eve in the beginning. The Eden life will be lived, the life in garden and field. Prophets and Kings, pages 730 and 731, 1914. Glory indescribable. I saw the exceeding loveliness and glory of Jesus. His countenance was brighter than the sun at noonday, his red than the whitest white. How can I describe to you the glories of heaven and the lovely angels singing and playing upon their harps of ten strings? Letter number 3, 1851. The wonderful things I saw I cannot describe. Oh, that I could talk in the language of Canaan, then could I tell a little of the glory of the better world. Early Writings, page 19, 1851. Language is altogether too feeble to attempt a description of heaven. As the scene rises before me, I am lost in amazement, carried away with the surpassing splendor and excellent glory. I lay down the pen and exclaim, Oh, what love! What wondrous love! The most exalted language fails to describe the glory of heaven or the matchless depths of a Savior's love. Early Writings, page 289, 1858. Human language is inadequate to describe the reward of the righteous. It will be known only to those who behold it. No finite mind can comprehend the glory of the paradise of God. Great Controversy, page 675, 1911. If we could have but one view of the celestial city, we would never wish to dwell on earth again. Signs of the Times, April 8, 1889. Streams, hills, and trees. Here we saw the tree of life and the throne of God. Out of the throne came a pure river of water, and on either side of the river was the tree of life. On one side of the river was a trunk of a tree, and a trunk on the other side of the river, both of pure transparent gold. At first I thought I saw two trees. I looked again and saw that they were united at the top in one tree. So it was the tree of life on either side of the river of life. Its branches bowed to the place where we stood, and the fruit was glorious. It looked like gold mixed with silver. Early Writings, page 17, 1851. There are ever-flowing streams, clear as crystal, and beside them waving trees cast their shadows 
upon the paths prepared for the ransomed of the Lord. There the wide-spreading plains swell into hills of beauty, and the mountains of God rear their lofty summits. On those peaceful plains, beside those living streams, God's people, so long pilgrims and wanderers, shall find a home. Great Controversy, page 675, 1911. Flowers, fruit, and animals. I saw another field, full of all kinds of flowers, and as I plucked them I cried out, They will never fade. Next I saw a field of tall grass, most glorious to behold. It was living grain and had a reflection of silver and gold as it waved proudly to the glory of King Jesus. Then we entered a field full of all kinds of beasts, the lion, the lamb, the leopard, and the wolf, all together in perfect union. We passed through the midst of them, and they followed on peaceably after. Then we entered a wood, not like the dark woods we have here, no, no, but light and all over glorious, the branches of the trees moved to and fro, and we all cried out, We will dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. We passed through the woods, for we were on our way to Mount Zion. On the mount was a glorious temple. There were all kinds of trees, and around the temple, to beautify the place, the box, the pine, the fir, the oil, the myrtle, the pomegranate, and the fig tree bowed down with the weight of its timely figs. These made the place all over glorious. And I saw a table of pure silver. It was many miles in length, yet our eyes could extend over it. I saw the fruit of the tree of life, the manna, almonds, figs, pomegranates, grapes, and many other kinds of fruit. I asked Jesus to let me eat of the fruit. Early Writings, pages 18 and 19, 1851. The Vigor of Eternal Youth All come forth from the graves, the same in stature as when they enter the tomb. Adam, who stands among the risen throng, is of lofty height and majestic form, in stature but little below the Son of God. He presents a marked contrast to the people of later generations. In this one respect is shown the great degeneracy of the race. But all arise with the freshness and vigor of eternal youth. Restored to the tree of life in the long-lost Eden, the redeemed will grow up. Malachi chapter 4 verse 2 to the full stature of a race in its primeval glory. Great Controversy, pages 644 and 645, 1911. If Adam, at his creation, had not been endowed with twenty times as much vital force as men now have, the race with their present habits of living in violation of natural law would have become extinct. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 3, page 138, 1872. None will need or desire repose. There will be no weariness in doing the will of God and offering praise to His name. We shall ever feel the freshness of the morning and shall ever be far from its close. The acquirement of knowledge will not weary the mind or exhaust the energies. Great Controversy, pages 676 and 677, 1911. Heaven is all health. Testimonies to the Church, volume 3, page 172, 1872. Happiness guaranteed. Jesus lifted the veil from the future life. In the resurrection, he said, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Matthew chapter 22, verse 30, Desire of Ages, page 605, 1898. There are men today who express their belief that there will be marriages and births in the new earth. But those who believe the Scriptures cannot accept such doctrines. 
The doctrine that children will be born in the new earth is not a part of the sure word of prophecy. It is presumption to indulge in suppositions and theories regarding matters that God has not made known to us in His Word. We need not enter into speculation regarding our future state. Selected Messages, Book 1, pages 172 and 173, 1904. Workers for God should not spend time speculating as to what conditions will prevail in the new earth. It is presumption to indulge in suppositions and theories regarding matters that the Lord has not revealed. He has made every provision for our happiness in the future life, and we are not to speculate regarding His plans for us. Neither are we to measure the conditions of the future life by the conditions of this life. Gospel Workers, page 314, 1904. Identity of the Redeemed Preserved The resurrection of Jesus was a type of the final resurrection of all who sleep in Him. The countenance of the risen Savior, His manner, His speech, were all familiar to His disciples. As Jesus arose from the dead, so those who sleep in Him are to rise again. We shall know our friends, even as the disciples knew Jesus. They may have been deformed, diseased, or disfigured in this mortal life, and they rise in perfect health and symmetry. Yet in the glorified body their identity will be perfectly preserved. Desire of Ages, page 804, 1898. The same form will come forth, but it will be free from disease and every defect. It lives again, bearing the same individuality of features, so that friend will recognize friend. Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1093, 1900. There we shall know, even as also we are known. There are the loves and sympathies that God has planted in the soul will find truest and sweetest exercise. Education, page 306, 1903. A ruddy complexion and a robe of light. As Adam came forth from the hand of his Creator, he was of noble height and of beautiful symmetry. He was more than twice as tall as men now living upon earth, and was well proportioned. His features were perfect and beautiful. His complexion was neither white nor sallow, but ruddy, glowing with the rich tint of health. Eve was not quite as tall as Adam. Her head reached a little above his shoulders. She too was noble, perfect in symmetry and very beautiful. Sons and Daughters of God, page 34, 1864. The sinless pair were of no artificial garments. They were clothed with a covering of light and glory, such as the angels wear. So long as they lived in obedience to God, this robe of light continued to enshroud them. Patriots and Prophets, page 45, 1890. The joy of seeing our family in heaven. We see a retinue of angels on either side of the gate. And as we pass in, Jesus speaks, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom that is prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Here he tells you to be a partaker of his joy, and what is that? It is the joy of seeing of the travail of your soul, fathers. It is the joy of seeing that your efforts, mothers, are rewarded. Here are your children. The crown of life is upon their heads. Child Guidance, page 567 and 568, 1895. God's greatest gift is Christ, whose life is ours given for us. He died for us and was raised for us that we might come forth from the tomb to a glorious companionship with heavenly angels to meet our loved ones and to recognize their faces for the Christ-likeness does not destroy their image but transforms it into his glorious image. Every saint connected 
in family relationship, here will know each other there. Selected Messages, Book 3, page 316, 1898. The Salvation of Infants and Imbeciles As the little infants come forth immortal from their dusty beds, they immediately wing their way to their mother's arms. They meet again, never more to part. But many of the little ones have no mother there. We listen in vain for the rapturous song of triumph from the mother. The angels receive the motherless infants and conduct them to the tree of life. Selected Messages, Book 2, pages 260, 1858. Some question whether the little children of even believing parents should be saved, because they have had no test of character, and all must be tested and their character determined by trial. The question is asked, how can little children have this test and trial? I answer that the faith of the believing parents covers the children, as when God sent his judgments upon the firstborn of the Egyptians. Whether all the children of unbelieving parents will be saved, we cannot tell, because God has not made known his purpose in regard to this matter, and we had better leave it where God has left it, and dwell upon subjects made plain in his word. Selected Messages, Book 3, pages 313 through 315, 1885. In regard to the case of A, you see him as he now is and deplore his simplicity. He is without the consciousness of sin. The grace of God will remove all this hereditary, transmitted imbecility, and he will have an inheritance among the saints in light. To you the Lord has given reason. A is a child as far as the capacity of reason is concerned, but he has the submission and obedience of a child. Manuscript Release, Volume 8, page 210, 1893. Tribute to Faithful Mothers When the judgment shall sit, and the books shall be opened, when the well done, of the great judge is pronounced, and the crown of immortal glory is placed upon the brow of the victor. Many will raise their crowns in sight of the assembled universe, and pointing to their mother say, She made me all I am through the grace of God. Her instruction, her prayers, have been blessed to my eternal salvation. Messages to Young People Page 330, 1881. The angels of God immortalize the names of the mothers whose efforts have won their children to Jesus Christ. Child Guidance, page 568, 1895. The Reward of the Winner of Souls. When the redeemed stand before God, precious souls will respond to their names who are there because of the faithful, patient efforts put forth in their behalf, the entreaties and earnest persuasions to flee to the stronghold. Thus those who in this world have been laborers together with God will receive their reward. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 8, pages 196 and 197, 1904. When the gates of that beautiful city on high are swung back on their glittering hinges, and the nations that have kept the truth shall enter in, crowns of glory will be placed on their heads, and they will ascribe the honor and glory and majesty to God. And at that time some will come to you and will say, If it had not been for the words you spoke to me in kindness, If it had not been for your tears and supplications and earnest efforts, I should never have seen the king in his beauty. What a reward is this? How insignificant is the prayings in this earthly transient life in comparison with the infinite rewards that await the faithful in the future immortal life? Words of encouragement to self-supporting workers.
113, volume 16, 1909. All dispositions unchanged. If you would be a saint in heaven, you must first be a saint on earth. The traits of character you cherish in life will not be changed by death or by the resurrection. You will come up from the grave with the same disposition you manifested in your home and in society. Jesus does not change the character at his coming. The work of transformation must be done now. Our daily lives are determining our destiny. Defects of character must be repented of and overcome through the grace of Christ, and a symmetrical character must be formed while in this probationary state that we may be fitted for the mansions above. Manuscript Release, Volume 13, page 82, 1891. Heaven's Peaceful and Loving Atmosphere The peace and harmony of the heavenly courts will not be marred by the presence of one who is rough or unkind. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 8, page 140, 1904. Everything in heaven is noble and elevated. All seek the interest and happiness of others. No one devotes himself to looking out and caring for self. It is the chief joy of all holy beings to witness the joy and happiness of those around him. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 2, page 239, 1869. I seem to be there where all was peace, where no stormy conflicts of earth could ever come. Heaven a kingdom of righteousness where all the holy and pure and blessed are congregated. Ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands living and walking in happy, pure intimacy, praising God and the Lamb who sitteth on the throne. Their voices were in perfect harmony. They never do each other wrong. Princes of heaven, the potentates of this mighty realm, are rivals only in good, seeking the happiness and joy of each other. The greatest there is least in self-esteem, and least is greatest in his gratitude and wealth of love. There are no dark errors to cloud the intellect. Truth and knowledge, clear, strong, and perfect, have chased every doubt away, and no gloom of doubt cast its baleful shadow upon its happy inhabitants. No voices of contention mar the sweet and perfect peace of heaven. Its inhabitants know no sorrow, no grief, no tears. All is in perfect harmony, in perfect order, and perfect bliss. Heaven is a home where sympathy is alive in every heart, expressed in every look. Love reigns there. There are no jarring elements, no discord or contentions or war of words. Manuscript Release, Volume 9, pages 104 and 105, 1882. No temptation and no sin. No tree of knowledge of good and evil will afford opportunity for temptation. No tempter is there, no possibility of wrong. Education page 302, 1903. I heard shouts of triumph from the angels and from the redeemed saints, which sounded like 10,000 musical instruments, because they were to be no more annoyed and tempted by Satan, and because the inhabitants of other worlds were delivered from his presence and his temptations. Story of Redemption, page 416, 1858. Communion with the Father and the Son. The people of God are privileged to hold open communion with the Father and the Son. We shall see Him face to face without a dimming veil between. Great Controversy, pages 676 and 677, 1911. We shall ever dwell with and enjoy the light of His precious countenance. My heart leaps with joy at the cheering prospect. Heavenly Places, page 352, 1856. Heaven is where Christ is. Heaven would not be heaven to those who love Christ if he were not there. 
manuscript number 41, 1897. There will be a close and tender relationship between God and the risen saints. Desire of Ages, page 606, 1898. Casting at the feet of the Redeemer the crowns that he had placed on our heads, and touching our golden harps, we shall fill all heaven with praise to him that sitteth on the throne. Testimonies to the Church, volume 8, page 254, 1904. If during this life they are loyal to God, they will at last see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Revelation chapter 22, verse 4. And what is the happiness of heaven but to see God? What greater joy could come to the sinner saved by the grace of Christ than to look upon the face of God and know him as Father? Testimonies to the Church, volume 8, page 268. 1904. Fellowship with angels and the faithful of all ages. Every redeemed one will understand the ministry of angels in his own life. The angel who was his guardian from his earliest moment. The angel who watched his steps and covered his head in the day of peril. The angel who was with him in the valley of the shadow of death. Who marked his resting place. Who was the first to greet him in the resurrection morning. What will it be to hold converse with him and to learn the history of divine interposition in the individual life of heavenly cooperation in every work for humanity? Education, page 305, 1903. From what dangers, seen and unseen, we have been preserved through the interposition of the angels, we shall never know until in the light of eternity we see the providences of God. Desire of Ages, page 240, 1898. The loves and sympathies which God himself has planted in the soul shall there find truest and sweetest exercise. The pure communion with holy beings, the harmonious social life with the blessed angels and with the faithful ones of all ages who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, the sacred ties that bind together the whole family in heaven and earth. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 15. These help to constitute the happiness of the redeemed. Great Controversy, page 677, 1911. Bearing Testimony to Unfallen Beings the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Christ's work below is His work above, and our reward for working with Him in this world will be the greater power and wider privilege of working with Him in the world to come. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 12. This also we shall be in eternity. For what was the great controversy permitted to continue throughout the ages? Why was it that Satan's existence was not cut short at the outset of his rebellion? It was that the universe might be convinced of God's justice in his dealing with evil that sin might receive eternal condemnation. In the plan of redemption there are heights and depths that eternity itself can never exhaust, marvels into which the angels desire to look. The redeemed only of all created beings have in their own experience known the actual conflict with sin. They have wrought with Christ and as even the angels could not do, have entered into the fellowship of his sufferings, will they have a testimony as to the signs of redemption, nothing that will be of worth to unfallen beings. Education, page 308, 1903. Praising God in Rich Melodious Music. There will be music there, and song, and such music and song as 
save in the visions of God, no mortal ear has heard or mind conceived. The song which the ransomed ones will sing, the song of their experience, will declare the glory of God. Great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God Almighty. Righteous and true are thy ways, thou King of the ages. Who shall not fear, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. Revelation chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. Revised Version, Education 307 through 309, 1903. There is one angel who always leads, who first touches the harp and strikes the note. Then all join in the rich, perfect music of heaven. It cannot be described. It is melody, heavenly, divine. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1, page 146, 1857. Not as a man of sorrows, but as a glorious and triumphant king, he will stand upon Olivet, while Hebrew hallelujahs mingle with Gentile hosannas, and the voices of the redeemed as a mighty host shall swell the acclamation, Crown him Lord of all. Desire of Ages, page 830-1898. Searching out the treasures of the universe. There when the veil that darkens and our vision shall be removed and our eyes shall behold that world of beauty of which we now catch glimpses through the microscope when we look on the glories of the heavens now scanned afar through the telescope, when the blight of sin removed, the whole earth shall appear in the beauty of the Lord our God. What a field will be open to our study. There the student of science may read the records of creation and discern no reminders of the law of evil. He may listen to the music of nature's voices and detect no note of wailing or undertone of sorrow. All the treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's children with unalterable delight. We shall enter into the joy and the wisdom of unfallen beings. We shall share the treasures gained through ages upon ages spent in contemplation of God's handiwork. Education, pages 303 and 307, 1903. Unfettered by mortality, they wing their tireless flight to worlds afar, worlds that thrilled with sorrow at this spectacle of human woe and rang with songs of gladness at the tidings of a ransomed soul. With undimmed vision they gaze upon the glory of creation, suns and stars and systems, all in their appointed order, circling the throne of deity. Upon all things, from the least to the greatest, the Creator's name is written, and in all are the riches of His power displayed. Great Controversy, pages 677 and 678, 1911. Sacred History Reviewed. The redeemed throng will range from world to world, and much of their time will be employed in searching out the mysteries of redemption. Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 990, 1886. The themes of redemption will employ the hearts and minds and tongues of the redeemed through the everlasting ages. They will understand the truths which Christ longed to open to his disciples, but which they did not have faith to grasp. Forever and forever, new views of the perfection and glory of Christ will appear. Through endless ages will the faithful householder bring forth from his treasure things new and old. Christ Object Lessons, page 134, 1900. Then will be opened before him the course of the great conflict 
that had its birth before time began, and that ends only when time shall cease. The history of the inception of sin, of fatal falsehood in its crooked working, of truth that swerving not from its own straight lines, has met and conquered error. All will be made manifest. The veil that interposes between the visible and the invisible world will be drawn aside, and wonderful things will be revealed. Education, page 304, 1903. Though the griefs and pains and temptations of earth are ended and the cause removed, the people of God will ever have a distinct, intelligent knowledge of what their salvation has cost. Our Redeemer will ever bear the marks of His crucifixion. Upon His wounded head, upon His side, His feet and hands are the only traces of the cruel work that sin has wrought. Great Controversy, pages 651 and 674, 1911. Life's perplexities explained. All the perplexities of life's experience will then be made plain. Where to us have appeared only confusion and disappointment, broken purposes and thwarted plans, will be seen a grand overruling, victorious purpose, a divine harmony. Education, page 305, 1903. There Jesus will lead us beside the living stream flowing from the throne of God and will explain to us the dark providences through which on this earth he brought us in order to perfect our characters. Testimonies of the Church, volume 8, Page 254, 1904. All that has perplexed us in the providences of God will in the world to come be made plain. The things hard to be understood will then find explanation. The mysteries of grace will unfold before us, where our finite minds discover only confusion and broken promises. We shall see the most perfect and beautiful harmony. We shall know that infinite love ordered the experiences that seemed most trying, as we realize the tender care of Him who makes all things work together for our good. We shall rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Testimonies to the Church, Volume Nine, Page Nineteen O Nine. The outworking of every noble deed. All who have wrought with unselfish spirit will behold the fruit of their labors. The outworking of every right principle and noble deed will be seen. Something of this we see here. But how little of the result of the world's noblest work is in this life manifest to the doer. How many toil unselfishly and unweariedly for those who pass beyond their reach and knowledge. Parents and teachers lie down in their sleep, their life works seeming to have been wrought in vain. They know not that their faithfulness has unsealed springs of blessing that can never cease to flow. Only by faith they see the children they have trained become a benediction and an inspiration to their fellow men, and the influence repeat itself a thousandfold. Many a worker send into the world messages of strength and hope and courage, words that carry blessings to hearts in every land, but of the results, he, toiling in loneliness and obscurity, knows little. So gifts are bestowed, burdens are borne, labor is done, men sow the seed from which above their graves, others reap blessed harvest. They plant trees that others may eat the fruit. They are content here to know that they have set in motion agencies for good. In the hereafter, the action and reaction of all these will be seen. Education, pages 305 and 306, 
1903. Our joy will constantly increase. There are mysteries in the plan of redemption. The humiliation of the Son of God, that he might be found in fashion as a man. The wonderful love and condescension of the Father in yielding up his Son, that are to the heavenly angels subjects of continual amazement. And these will be the study of the redeemed through eternal ages. As they contemplate the work of God in creation and redemption, new truth will continually unfold to the wondering and delightful mind. As they learn more and more of the wisdom, the love, and the power of God, their minds will be constantly expanding, and their joy will continually increase. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, pages 702 and 703, 1889. And the years of eternity, as they roll, will bring richer and still more glorious revelations of God and of Christ. As knowledge is progressive, so will love, reverence, and happiness increase. The more men learn of God, the greater will be their admiration of his character. As Jesus opens before them the riches of redemption and the amazing achievements in the great controversy with Satan, the hearts of the ransom thrill with more fervent devotion and with more rapturous joy, they sweep the harps of gold, and ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands of voices unite to swell the mighty chorus of praise. Great Controversy, page 678, 1911. Ever an infinity beyond. Every power will be developed, every capability increased, the grandest enterprise will be carried forward. The loftiest aspirations will be reached. The highest ambitions realized. And still there will arise new heights to surmount, new wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend, fresh objects to call forth the powers of body and mind and soul. Education, page 307, 1903. However far we may advance in the knowledge of God's wisdom and His power, there is ever an infinity beyond. Review and Herald, September 14, 1886. All the paternal love which has come down from generation to generation through the channel of human hearts, all the springs of tenderness which have opened in the souls of men, or but as a tiny rill to the boundless ocean when compared with the infinite, exhaustless love of God. Tongue cannot utter it. Pen cannot portray it. You may meditate upon it every day of your life. You may search the Scriptures diligently in order to understand it. You may summon every power and capability that God has given you in the endeavor to comprehend the love and compassion of the Heavenly Father. And yet, there is an infinity beyond. You may study that love for ages, yet you can never fully comprehend the length and the breadth and the depth of the height of the love of God in giving His Son to die for the world. Eternity itself can never fully reveal it. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 740. The whole universe declares that God is love. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From Him who created all, flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, 
all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is love. Great Controversy, page 678, 1911.